well, thanks again for being here at the summit. This is a really unique opportunity for us to talk about what we've been up to, and just really happy to see so many faces here um, for this week. So, Mark gave an overview of the why, right, where we are in the world with big software, uh, how things are changing, um, and Rick walks you through the how, which is uh, you know, Juju and, and specifically into the language of modeling and uh, controllers and units and things like that. And I'm here to talk to you a little bit about what, uh, with a bit of a focus on the big data charts. Actually, entirely focused on the big data charts. But I uh, have a quick question for you in the audience. Who here is working in big data, or interested in or learning about big data? Good. Oh, even better. Because otherwise, you guys are in the wrong room. Uh, so I'm going to take you through some of the things that we have in the Juju ecosystem related to big data. My name is Kevin Monroe. I am on the big software team. Uh, and we have a selection of terms that I think are pretty interesting to look at and talk to. So that's what we're going to do today. First, I'll just give the sort of lowdown on what the big software team is. There are five of us. Uh, we focus today on two things big data and machine learning. Right, these concepts of software. Very complex. Lots of moving parts. We have lots of scale, we have interoperability issues, um, and not to mention just many, 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 probably hundreds of applications that would fall under the data umbrella. Uh, so to get all these things to talk to you, you really need just a tight model, something that you can uh, really rely on. And the same with machine learning, right? Machine learning, many of you may think of something like Spark, uh, TensorFlow, and Neo4j. Um, and sort of uh, in-memory processing of large data sets and uh, some machine learning. So that's what the big software team at Canonical is all about. Uh, since this is a, a big data charming project, I'll mention, I'm glad that Cost was able to make it uh, to the summit. Uh, we model charms based on Apache Big Top. Anybody heard of Apache Big Top before? Hands up, great, Cost, yeah. Good, good for you. Uh, Big Top is a new project that uh, their, their logo is like a big service tent, right? It's, it's the wrangling of all these services and applications that need to come together to solve a large big data problem um, with some amount of confidence. And the way they get that confidence is by uh, rigorous testing and integration tests and, and checking different versions that they're compatible with uh, versions of other software. Uh, and so they do a great job of, of producing a release of 35, 40 applications that are all uh, uh, sort of guaranteed to work together. You have confidence that this is going to be able to build a good solution. So we built off of their good work uh, and model our ecosystem around the big top charms. And so that's what we are going to look at today is some of the big top applications that we can leverage to make models and solve big data problems. So as I mentioned, there are oodles and oodles of applications, and that makes it big data complicated. Um, again, version dispatches, um, particular requirements, some things only work on some hardware platforms. I mean, to get your mind around all the stuff that has to talk together, uh, it gets very complicated, and even worse, when you, uh, let's say you find a solution and you realize, dang, I need this to be twice as big. Right? How do you, do you start over and you begin to build this up again uh, from zero? If you do, then I, you're doing it wrong. But it's, it's nice to know that there's a, there's a solution for handling these kind of things. Right? That includes scale and the interoperability that we mentioned there for all these applications. So Rick asked me to make a chart yesterday when he saw these slides. And he said, give me a chart of how we got here. I want to see your timeline. And this is all I could come up with. In the beginning, there was small data. Time happened. Now we have big data. So I was in looking for this picture that I couldn't find. Um, there's something like one and a half exabytes of data generated. It's huge, it's enormous. It's mostly unstructured, it's tweets. Yeah, it's tweets. Um, and pictures and you know, all kinds of stuff. Just an enormous amount of data. And so the reason big data is around is because people discovered within the last 50 years or whatever, it was cheaper to move the processing to the data rather than trying to move the data to the compute. So now that we have even more uh, 
tonnage of data around. This is even more relevant to us today. So, even though I did a pretty good job here, this is a bit better picture. I mean, it's not meant for you to read, it's just meant to show that big data solutions can be complex, right? This is from a company called Inside Edge, where there's a product called Inside Edge. It's just their architecture, uh, what, what they're looking at. And look at how many components have to fit together to enable this architecture. From the ground up, we've got our data source, right? So this would be the Hadoop distributed file system, HDFS. Could be Cassandra, it could be any number of, could be a CSV file, whatever. All kinds of data sources here. That data needs to be managed by something. In HDFS, that's called a name node. It's like what knows where all this data lives. Um, and then you may want to do some processing on it. In this case, for this application, this problem, uh, they're using Spark and some very specific libraries that went into Spark to enable um, their product. But even, even when you say Spark, that means you know, Spark SQL, Spark Streaming, machine learning uh, libraries within Spark. Uh, so each of these components is just massively complex. And now you've got a processor and you want to get data into it. So how are you going to do that? Is it via mobile? Is it via Internet of Things devices? Is it via something like Kafka, which is a published, subscribed um, method of moving data, moving data messages around? So you get your data in, you get it processed, you get it stored, and now you want to visualize it, right? How many times did X happen? Uh, how many times did X happen by people under 30? Um, that kind of stuff. Uh, the visualization over here, Zeppelin, another Apache project, phenomenal. Show you a demo of uh, that one in just a moment. Uh, but that allows you to sort of interact with your cluster, uh, run your jobs, get your results, and give you a nice uh, visualization in there. So it's complex. Right? The solution to this problem or this complexity is, in our world, Juju, right? We believe that application modeling is the way to uh, put best practices into reusable components. Um, and share and peer review uh, into a model that can be replicated across uh, many substrates, be it containers in your laptop, or clouds in the sky, or bare metal, or wherever. Uh, so we believe that application modeling really handles this complexity, and I think you'll agree with me by the time I get through this presentation, it's going to be the whole here. I want to focus on this second bullet point. Here's a pro tip if you ever talk to Mark Shuttleworth. When he says something like twice or three times, he kind of gives you a look. The look means we get this right. right. This, this is important. So I had the opportunity to speak to him in ApacheCon Vancouver this month or a few months ago. And he said this, and he kept saying this, and he kept giving me that look. And I said, hmm, this is important. And then it finally clicked for me, this decoupling of the architecture from the substrate and how important that is. So I'll give you a quiz. He mentioned some operations, some operational logic, ops code that like gets encapsulated into jar. You remember what those were? What are operational steps? Dependency installation. Dependency installation, installation in general, scaling. The example we talked about earlier was backing up a database. Right, so how do you, you back up MySQL? What does that look like? Um, when another MySQL comes along, are you in fail mode, or replication mode, active passive mode? Uh, when you want to stop or start the database, so when another database comes along, uh, you know, or another service comes along, how do you get your information over to it? All those are operational things that you need to know uh, how to exploit to have a, a good uh, piece of software running. So you encapsulate those in charms, and what's so beautiful about those is once that's done, once that charm is available, that charm is not tied to any particular substrate. We don't have a charm for like C containers and another for AWS. Right? That, that would be silly. All these charms work across all substrates. Not only that, that kind of bleeds into uh, an architecture talk as well. So a substrate may be an Intel cloud. Right? Azure has Intel instances available. Or it could be a PowerPC cloud. Right? So, uh, Rackspace is working on Power Cloud. Someone else, Ray Brown over here, if you would tell me more on Power Cloud for. But PowerPC is an architecture that you might care about. Or you might be on bare metal on the mainframe, the S390 architecture. These charms will do the right thing, will 
do their operations that have been baked into them, regardless of the substrate, regardless of the architecture. And that's really powerful for me. So that's why I wanted to spend so much time on point two there. Um, and that also leads into reusability. Right? Once you've done this once, you may test it on your laptop, but before you on the mainframe, it's nice to know that that's the same thing um, from a reusability perspective. So let's look at the core Hadoop bundle. These are all charms that are available in the store. All these charms are free and open source software, by the way. Um, I think like 99% of sure all of ours are Apache Um So here's a, a base of new cluster. This model, I just put this here so you can remember the context picture. It's just this little bit right here. It's just a uh, what this is, What this entails, though, is a resource manager that executes jobs, it splits out particular problem and it goes and fetches computer resources that may be needed. And then it has a uh, shared file system component, HDFS, which involves a name node that knows where the data lives <clears throat> and a data node that the actual data is stored on. Uh, and over to the right here, we have something special. I'll get to that in just a minute with our plugin. And this is to represent the client. Anything you might have, is this a Twitter stream? Is this a cat of a log? Is this a message being passed from a broker? Anything like that. So what I want to show is that the, a complex environment like Hadoop can be modeled pretty simply. I mean, this is just Java in the middle. Any Java you can use, uh, whatever Java you would like. And in this model, though it looks simple, this could be a thousand uh, slave machines. Scale out. You don't necessarily care about that when you're modeling and designing your solution, uh, but it, it's, it's nice to know that, that decoupling has happened such that I don't have to worry. If it's a thousand machines, it's going to behave just the same as it would otherwise. So I mentioned the, the secret sauce here. This is our plugin. The plugin is very similar to what uh, the interfaces and the relationships that Mark and Rick and the party introduced. This is a common endpoint into a Hadoop cluster. So that means name node, IP addresses, port numbers, um, and resource manager uh, information that, that clients may need to use. We, we create this plugin, and anybody that wants to connect to that um, will, will get the information of the cluster. It essentially hides all the stuff on the left. You don't want to need to worry about setting this up, maintaining it, whether or not things are going to be compatible. You simply hit your endpoint. And then you can uh, access the cluster and do what you need to do that. So let's talk about some of the things you can do. Right, the Hadoop cluster by itself is pretty useful, uh, but expensive. Um, so we want to get some data into it. Let's talk about data congestion. Right, anybody familiar with Kafka and Flume? Do you have a preference? The answer is Flume. Yes. Flume is awesome. I wish Sam were here. Uh, Sam goes that hates Flume. Anyway, uh, so let's get some data in here. Kafka. This could be uh, a listener that is being fed by tweets or by logs or by uh, any of a number of IoT devices that might be able to publish to a Kafka topic. This could have tens, hundreds, whatever uh, machines behind it. I just know that Kafka is my subscription-based message passer that I want to, uh, to get messages from. To enable that sort of flexibility or scalability of Kafka, you have a, a sort of an HA enabler, Zookeeper, um, to, to handle some of the complexity of having multiple Kafka brokers. But now I have a message, however it was originated. I have a message, and I want to send it into HDFS. Flume is a really neat uh, application for doing that. You can scale Flume in a variety of ways. If you've ever read the, the config page for Flume, um, it's just crazy how many things you can do with it. Replicate messages. You can send these messages to Elasticsearch and these to Hadoop. Uh, you, can, you can fan out your Flume instances as your data grows, as the amount of data coming in grows. Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention this. Now, now we're on here. Right? This is getting data into this complex thing. So that's an ingestion story for us. Flume and Kafka are pretty typical uh, methods of getting data into a cluster. Once you have all that data in there, sometimes it's easier to provide operators or scientists or whatever with a language that they may be familiar with. A 
lot of people are familiar with SQL. So Hive is an application that uh, provides a SQL-like interface into Hadoop. So it allows you to run, I'll show you some examples later, it allows you to run things like select data where key is less than 10 or whatever. So it's a very natural uh, interface way to process data that's already in Hadoop if you're familiar with SQL. There are oodles and oodles of other ways to process data. Kate Latin comes to mind um, as, a, as a service that you can use to um, work with your data there. Once your data is in there, maybe you run some processing jobs on it with Hive. You realize that's not quite what I wanted to do. I wanted to do a little more in-memory uh, processing. And for that, you might say, I think Spark is for me. So uh, you can extend this Hadoop cluster with Spark. And Spark, again, can be HA. and have multiple Spark masters and be able to fail over and, and distribute work to any number of workers under this. That could be a thousand Spark clients or Spark workers. Manage, manage the, the HA-ness, high availability with Zookeeper there. And then again, like I mentioned, provide Zeppelin right, as a way to engage your cluster. And it's, so now we're kind of representing this piece. And I have a point right? Um, but representing that middle and that left piece there. So these are just kind of three different use cases that you could use to extend a basic cluster. If you wanted to have a, a more real world solution, you would perhaps combine the three, right? So I want to generate some data. So I have a, a secret server here that's generating, or that I want to monitor for uh, attacks or uh, whatever I might want to do. Um, I want to get that log information off, I want to get saved somewhere in do, and then I want to uh, take a look at it with Spark and Zeppelin. So, you know, you can, you can really, once you have a problem statement, it's very easy to begin building a model that will help you solve that. And these are just half a dozen or so charms that we've uh, talked about so far, but there are lots more in the charm store. Uh, so these are deployable today. And can be used as sort of your building blocks to uh, extend a model or create a model that works for your solution. So, what do people do with big data? Right? They read Twitter with big data and push for it. Um, they also do some log analysis, right? So, watching for SSH attacks or breaking attempts, or watching um, web server logs, things like that. They do that to gain some insights on what's happening on a particular server that they care about. Or, uh, like in the Twitter case, they do it to measure sentiment. You know, what, what's the world think of the latest Pepsi ad? Boo is what the world thinks of the latest Pepsi ad. It's terrible. Um, somebody mentioned the other day, Randall told me about, or he, he piped in and said, they do it for terrorism. I thought it was a joke. I thought it was being funny. And then later he's like, no, I'm being serious, you know, to measure sentiment of Terrorist activity, that's a big data problem. So I have to put it in the morning for our counterintelligence unit. I talked to him this morning and I said, hey, what kind of stuff are you doing to do like sentiment analysis of uh, missions that you might go on? And it's surprisingly a lot. Um, so Randall wasn't being funny. Um, they look at, after a mission has been completed, they monitor social media in the affected areas. They say, or they look and find, or they try to find, was this perceived as good or bad? Do they want this to happen more or less? Or, you know, and it's just very interesting to, to hear about um, uh, how, how real life is sort of impacted by um, things, the events of the world, and how we can then take those events and, and model the big data uh, solution around it to help find out. By the way, they, the, they we're not using any of our charms, but I will do my best to change that in the future. I never use really weird stuff to do this model. So there's a lot of examples about what you would do with real data. I want to go back to this this model that we put together here from the, the few use cases um, that we've come over so far. What I want to do, and this will require some of uh, your help, is I have a server out there. It's called a secret server. I really don't like it when people SSH to my secret server. So I want to know, on that secret server, I want to forward those SSH attempt logs, the 
logs that include the SSH account. I want to those off. Uh, and I get them into HDFS and look at them. All right, so this is what we're going to do. First, we're going to. So, full disclosure, I have two of these deployed. One of them is a, uh, it's already stood up. I just want to show you how easy it is to deploy. Um, Can you increase the file size, please? Yeah. So, what, what you have on the right. Uh, what you have on the left here is that that's my deploy command. I just deployed uh, a bundle of charms, right? Rick was talking about what a bundle was before. It contains uh, a definition of a model. How many of these particular services do I want? What are the applications called? How do they relate to one another? And you'll see on the on the right, this is just a real-time watch of the Juju status command that's showing uh, what these applications are doing. Uh, we offer a lot of status in that output that's showing things like you have a name node and you have a resource manager, but you haven't connected the two, so they won't function as a Hadoop cluster until you do. All right, so you see the deployment has been accepted by the controller there. Um, I won't make you watch the, uh, well, yeah, no, 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 no. So, these are the So, these are the applications that I want to deploy in this. Here's how they all relate to each other. Uh, and here are the actual machines that are starting to spin up. They're getting their operating systems open, they're getting their applications deployed, and they're getting configured um, as my model has requested that they can. So I'm going to switch over to one that's already going active. Here's a little bit more of that rich status that I was talking about. So you can see things like you know, how many data nodes are in this cluster, um, how many uh, application uh, resources I have, about 15 minutes left, so I want to make sure that we can get this demo good. Uh, but so that gives you an idea of what a what this model looks like when it's deployed. Right? So if you have the ability, please SSH something at this thing. Remember, this is the IP address of our secret server. This is where I want to monitor for um, people trying to hack me to get into my system. So pick a username, right? It could be anything. Uh, within reason. We'll show what, whatever the name you pick. It'll show on the screen in just a minute. I'm going to leave that, that address will be in the upper right, but uh, go ahead and, and SSH. And I want to, this is issue this yeah, That's it. What I want to talk about what's happening right now as you are SSHing into this thing is you're hitting our secret server. The R syslog charm is forwarding that information off onto a Flume listener who has been configured to listen for our syslog events. That Flume listener then says, I'm supposed to send this data into HDFS, and so it does. And we get it into HDFS. Then we can open our Zeppelin interface, run SparkJob on that, and pull out our usernames uh, in, uh, in whenever you whatever the data is that you've sent The hope here is that become complex solutions required for big data. Once they're done, once, uh, once you have a way to model and reuse um, any kind of solution that you may need, it, it lets you get to the sign on the left, right? You forget the diamond part on the right. You get to you get to work where you want to be. As a data scientist, I doubt we're interested in knowing that the name node has five data nodes or whatever. Like you, you just don't, I hope that as a data scientist, you don't care much about how the cluster got there. You just want it there to be able to get to work. And that's what we are trying to um, provide for this community is the ability to just get to work, knowing that you can reuse uh, model do whatever you need to do to get to a point where you can begin focusing on the science. I saw this because I saw it in Marsh charts. These five things. And I wanted to compare and contrast what, what our core of the new cluster, the thing that we've seen, the common motif throughout these slides, what it is and what it could be. Right? So scale, you could have, again, a thousand of these worker nodes. Right? Same model, looks the same. 
but it could be back by many, many, many more nodes. Uh, if this is not enough for you, if you need introspection into your cluster, you want to monitor things as they're happening in the cluster, go ahead and hook up metric data works, right? Game with is monitoring the systems in this space of the cluster for system level metrics. Our syslog is tacked on there, so we're getting forward off to whatever log uh, service you may want to, to do. And all of these charms work the same, again, when deployed on your laptop, or maybe you have resource constraints that don't allow you to get to this kind of model. You can start here. Reuse the same charms when you do move to a larger environment or to a different uh, substrate. Because with the opcode thing that they are, all of these charms are baked to know how they should react to life cycle events and things that have to happen uh, for the charm to do its job. And then substitute fits really well here because if you don't want ganglia, it's a, it's a, it's a, all of these charms support a monitoring inter interface that you can substitute in Nagios or the beat stack, right? just top beat and file beat and those types of other monitors there. If you don't want our syslog, substitute that for logstash, Elasticsearch, those types of things. All right, let's check on the demo and check the clock. I really hope this works. All right, just a second. It's really cool. If you've never played with Zephyr, right? it's, a, it's, a, it's a web notebook. Right? You store chunks of um, code in these little paragraphs and you save away these notebooks. That code may be doing something in the shell, maybe uh, uh, retrieving data with SQL, stuff like that. And once you have a notebook, so we have a notebook. This is already put into the charm, into the Zeppelin charm. So when you deploy Zeppelin for us, you'll get this and be able to reproduce this uh, as you wish. Um, all these individual little notebooks, or I'm sorry, Individual paragraphs can be executed serially. So the markdown one doesn't take too long because there's you know, nothing. Um, this is just a small shell paragraph. In case you guys did not SSH me, I will do it myself, uh, just in case I need to. But this will generate 10, 10 new, uh, new events in my syslog there. But I have faith that you guys did what I asked. And it looks like you did because this is a recent timestamp and there's quite a bit of data in there. Again, that's just a shell listing of, of the files that Flynn has written. Uh, in fact, 2,200 entries. Um, this is uh, another paragraph. Again, I mentioned why I like Zeppelin so much. Is, uh, this is Scala. That was shell before that was marked down. Later we'll see as well. Uh, it's just really powerful that you can have all these um, facets of your uh, big data solution in, a, in, a, in the same number. It looks like all these have finished. And we indeed have 2,300 SSH logs. That's awesome. See, uh, just to show you some scout that actually pulled out the information, you can think of this as a regular expression um, for matching what that log will look like. So that whoever wrote this notebook knows that it's going to get an IP address and a time and a name and a whatever. But this is just us fil filtering out from this particular location on disk, um, you know, does it contain SSH? And that's, that's how we figure out the username. All right. Here's the SQL that does the magic. And I'm now thinking this to make it current. Nice. Mr. Robot. This must be Charles Butler. I would bet anything that that's Chuck. But these are the names of you guys. Uh, brought in. I'm super glad that the blink tag did not <laughs> render. <laughs> or blink, Mr. Robot, or you just forgot to close it. Nice guy in orange, I like it. So far, no customers, everybody doing good? Did you rock some of you? Blue ha ha, bunch of zeros. Alright, so that's our demo, right? So, what's happened is um, the data, I mean, obviously the data is gone through, been processed by film, and then we took a look at it. Um, so what I challenge you to do next, just a few minutes left, but I hope during the rest of the time here during the week that you'll come stop by our track room 
And I have a challenge for you, and it's to deploy this. Except maybe don't deploy this one, though. I'll, I'll show you where these are in GitHub um, and, and in the store. Uh, you don't need to necessarily deploy this bundle, but maybe think of, you know, instead of Zeppelin, I want to try a different interface, or I want to do this from the command line, or I want to, um, instead of Spark, use a different processing engine to analyze the log stuff. So maybe it's Hive instead of Spark or whatever. Uh, so I would, I would love to help people walk through this. Uh, we think it's a pretty friction-free way to get started in data. Um, if you're already started in it, I still think it's a really friction-free way to, to get work done in big data. Um, but we're very interested in the workflows that you use. So try this stuff out. Let us know how we can help you get started if, uh, if you have any roadblocks. Um, and most of all, um, you know, just uh, explore the ecosystem that we have. Let us know where we're falling down. I Maybe mean, don't have applications and you have some ideas about how we can get those into our community. Uh, and again, I know Marco's already said, but we're in this back. Corner room there, just means east. Uh, and finally, will the big data team please stand up or the big software team out there, so that people can see who you know that's Corey, Kostas, and we're all run by the field of So that's it really for the talk. I do have resources, these will be up. We'll just leave these up in our track room uh, so that you can see uh, mailing list, uh, typical resource list here. I'll call again the free cloud credentials at the developer program URL, um, but that's where you can find more information about 